Welcome to the NBA Coast to Coast podcast brought to you by thelines.com. Coming to you from the West Coast, Josh Lander, joined by Nate Weitzer. He's on the East Coast, and we have player props on a Monday for you. Late night here on Sunday as we get ahead of some of these early player prop lines, so looking for some value are we. We also have best bets up for you in a a separate video, which we have each and every weekday, so make sure to subscribe to that page and continue to follow along with us all season and into this postseason as this thing winds down, like 15 games or so for most of these teams left on the record on the schedule here. Uh, Do want to make sure you head head over to thelines.com as well. We tell you about that all the time putting up a bunch of articles each and every day during the week for these things uh so you can get all that info there including the prop finder tool that we have up there under the nba tab you can use that to make sure that you see all the odds from all these books giving us bets this season nate let's go ahead and get right into our bread and butter here the play of props and a name i have not heard in a while desmond bain yeah, I think when when last we were taking him, we got an under against the Clippers. This was months ago, but uh, yeah, he's back in the lineup. Second game back for him, and I'll take advantage of the low scoring line relatively. Over 21.5 points, you can get minus 115 at Caesar on that uh, after he scores 22 points on 32% usage against OKC in the return. I mean, there was some talk going into it, Taylor Jenkins saying, like, we're not going to like push him that hard. But 32% usage indicates he is he's good to go. He was a plus 11. He was basically the reason they're in that game and the big reason that if you're going to take Memphis plus 10 here at SAC, I, I don't think that's a terrible bet as long as you you think Triple J is going to be alongside him there uh, to give them some some defense against Sabonis, who's just been killing people. But otherwise, it's a skeleton crew for Memphis. Uh, still, we know. I mean, there's, there's nobody else besides Bain to soak up usage and – I, I mean, I, if you project him for 32% usage again, his last four at Sacramento on 26% usage, he's scoring 26 points per game uh, on ridiculously unsustainable splits, 60 and 74% from deep. But, I mean, he, he looked sharp against OKC, which is a better defense, a much better wing defense than Sacramento. Went four for nine from deep. On the season on the road, 26.5 points, 30% usage. I mean, Memphis has been shorthanded all season and looking for him to get stuff done. And, and Kings are tied second worst in terms of their opponent's effective field goal percentage at home, also giving up the fifth highest free throw rate. Um, and they've been vulnerable against shooting guards for years now. So it's not surprising that Baines had success in this matchup. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it, tar- targeting anybody against the Kings right now uh, is not a terrible play. They've been giving it up uh, all over the place and, and against bad teams as well. It's, I understand the idea of taking Memphis or, uh, to, to cover, you know, 10, 10 and a half points with Bain back. It's it's about Triple J, though. I don't want to get caught with my pants down and take 10 and a half without Triple J in that one. If Triple J is not in, yeah, I, I don't know why you would limit Bain's field goals at all uh, at that point. And, and it wouldn't shock me if Triple J sits with Bain back going like, well, we can't come too close to winning this game. So let's keep our two actual NBA fringe all-stars, if you will, uh, on the bench here, at least one of them. And and with Bain back, who he should be back in this one. We've got the props and everything. Then, then yeah, I, I'm going to I would ride with that one before anything else. Like it's going to be a barrage of shots for him more than anything, which is what I look at. So speaking of a barrage of shots, I expect the same thing from DG the PG Darius Garland on Cleveland to go over 22 and a half points in this one. It's minus 120 on DraftKings. Uh, and it's just a situation where uh, I've talked about this a little bit in the the, the best bets video, talking about um, probably points for for Indiana. But as far as Cleveland goes, and it's it's without Donnie Mitchell again, without Max Struess again, we're talking about another game of, of Darius Garland just being the primary, almost entirely, uh, you know, offense really in the way the amount of shots that he's taken, which we've seen from him as well. Like without uh, Donnie Mitchell over the course of these last 10 games or so, he's up to about 17, 18 field goal attempts per game. And he's a pretty efficient dude to be getting 23 points on, you know, let's say 17 field goal attempts. Even uh, he, he is capable of getting the foul line, as we know. Also, I mean, he's putting putting up nine and a half threes without Donnie Mitchell uh, and getting to the free throw line about three to four times per game without him. So it's not like he's really doing as much when he's the the point guard and not like sort of the off ball guard a little bit more like when Donnie Mitchell's out there. But what it does mean is that he's going to be the, the main dude in the, the main play that they run, which is that pick and roll. And he'll be the ball handler and he'll be probably pulling up a lot from out there. And, and that's why you see 
Indiana not doubling. They don't switch. They don't double. And as a result, guys like Darius Garland, who, who are coming off screens uh, and, and shooting from above the break a lot, I mean, they're going to continue to have be able to get theirs. Uh, the Indy is giving up the most points per game to uh, the opposing ball handler in, in the pick and roll on the season. Uh, and like I said, a big part of that, their, their uh, issues against isolation as well is just a lack of double teams. And so if you're a good, if you have a good one-on-one matchup, like, I mean, look, there's going to be some dudes out there that are capable, like Nembhard is a fine defender uh, for the minutes that he's getting. Tyrese hasn't really proven to be a, a, a sort of liability on defense, but he's certainly a, at best like a net a neutral, if anything, right? Uh, which is why you see like p- point guards getting a ton of points against this indie team and not necessarily getting a ton of assists against this indie team. I thought about going under six and a half assists, but if if he if they if he really is going to be in the pick and roll as often as the team team it will like maybe like twelve. 11, 12 times in this game is that's been the amount that they're running things with him without Donovan Mitchell over the last like 10 games or so, then yeah, he's going to be in the running to get the the dimes as well as the points, uh, the, the points and assists combines a little bit high, but 22 and a half points, which we might see this at 23, 24 and a half before we get into tomorrow. I mean, the, the total has dropped a little bit from the open, but the pace for the, the Pacers has still come right back to about third fastest in the league after dipping down a little bit while we waited for Tyrese to get his numbers back up or his minutes back up from what they were when he was coming back from injury still so uh you also see him out in the transition where uh the indiana has also been terrible mostly because they're always running in transition on offense and so it takes them a while to get back when they have to get enough guys back behind the ball and while cleveland's only run the 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 transition offense like about middle of the pack i would say they've been really efficient uh, efficient with it uh, the second most points per possession when they are in the transition uh so if they're going to get out in the frequency with which we expect them to because of how often this indie team is going to be running then that's going to just give him a couple more opportunities every each time to uh, in this game rather to get those points so uh, i'm, I'm going to ride with him over 22 and a half points yeah, interesting. You had under points and assists, though, originally, right? Because you don't like the assists because Pacers don't give that up. They they guard point guards really well in terms of that. But, yeah, not doubling them, not giving up assists behind the play. So wouldn't be surprising if he does get, like, 23 points and five assists and go under that assist prop um, in this spot. But, yeah, I, I mean, you're going to need Garland to score a lot if you want the Cavs to cover or you want it over here. I just don't know, yeah, if he really is that guy when he's got to be the number one option, um, how it's going to go. But but to find out. We'll find out. Um, Speaking of number one, DeMar DeRozan under 25 and a half points. I know the clutch player of the year, runaway favorite now, coming off a couple of huge performances on the road mostly. Uh, But, yeah, now home against Portland. The Bulls are about seven-point favorites here. It's the ninth game in 14 days for Chicago, which is just utterly exhausting. And DeRozan, for some reason, played 35 minutes when they won by 30, 35-ish against Washington. Uh, so he's not going to be very rested. But like we see, like he he does not have to put up big lines when they play these lesser teams. Like he had 13 points on 15% usage against Washington. Uh, you know, he's under in six of his last seven at home where, you know, that you expect the Bulls to be in control of the game more often and not need him to just save them in the half court, which is what he did on a lot of that West Coast road trip. His last seven road games, he's averaging 30 on on 26.5% usage versus, again, yeah, under 20 at home. And if you look at short rest or even normal rest, 22.5 on one day rest, 21.5 if it was a back-to-back, it is not. But like I said, it's just a lot of games in two weeks. For these for this Bulls team, and this it's not been a deep roster. Like he's playing at least thirty five minutes almost every single game. Sometimes forty plus. So they've had these overtime games. Like that's in fact the only time he's gone over this at home is when they had double overtime against Cleveland in his last seven. Portland, I mean, not not a great defense um, necessarily, but they muck it up. Right, they play in the mud. They're allowing just the fifth fewest field goal attempts since the all-star break. Right. So, I mean, mm-hmm. they are allowing a lot of free throws on the, on the flip side of that thing, but DeRozan, like these unders have come despite him getting eight free throw attempts per game. Like that's, he'll get those points, but I just don't expect huge usage here with, with the props as high as they are for like Caruso and AO Desunmu. I mean, the books are expecting the bulls to have success as a team here and not necessarily just lean on DeRozan like they've had to sometimes. Yeah. That, that makes total sense to me. I mean, there, there's a little bit of an interesting look at the fact that the, the Blazers actually play defense in a way that is kind of tailor-made to start to, to stop uh, DeMar DeRozan. Like, DeMar's going to do his thing in the half court. We know that. 
Uh, in terms of ISO ball, this this Portland team has been really good on defense against isolation. That's one one thing that we know that he wants to do. How are they against defending the mid range? Pretty good as well with some with a few long rangey defenders. We'll see who's playing in this one. We know we're going to get some Tumani Kamara, who I haven't mentioned since like the beginning of the season. But I do think has a future in the NBA as a long rangey defender uh, wing in this league. We'll, we'll see who, like I said, is Jeremy Grant going to play? It's at least helpful for that mid range stuff to be able to have another guy that you see is versatile enough to get out there and guard. Uh, I do think Kamara probably starts on him and continues to get those minutes, which is another reason I might even consider a Kamara over seven and a half points prop in this one. I think he is going to get the minutes to, to play there. I don't I don't know that this is going to be a total blowout, but I don't know that that necessarily is what you need in order to get DeMar to, to go under here. I, I, I love the play. I should make clear, like I definitely will tail this one uh, with you as as we look for that correlation between Demar needing to really put the team on his back dough and really not even worrying about it quite as much. And I think this is a I'm not quite as worried about it, and I'm tired. Uh, and if ever there was a time to take a break, I would assume it's against the Portland Trailblazers, who just got pounced again by the Pellies on the road again. I should say by the Pellies, but they're not really looking to to put too many points up. And I, at some point, you got to sit Demar Derozan uh, if they are up by that many points. But I, I, I love the look for the way that the, the strength of Portland's defense should be able to at least uh, limit him to the to under twenty six here. So. Uh, and we might not get enough possessions in that game with the, the, the pace of those two teams. But let me close it out with a prop that I still think is low for my guy Hartenstein on the Knickerbockers. Uh, over 17 and a half PR for Hartenstein. He had uh, 28 and a half minutes that he played last game. I think he's back to his normal minutes. Uh, there's no way you play him 28 and a half compared to the 23 minutes, 22 minutes per game that he was playing the previous nine to 10 games because they were ramping him up. So I love when we get a situation where the books are probably projecting him still at about 24, 25 minutes in this game. And I would project him at higher uh, because you do need to have a, that the uh, defensive rebounding presence and they have no better defensive rebounder than Isaiah Hartenstein against the Warriors who have been one of the best uh, offensive rebounding teams and, and rely some most almost uh, as heavily as anyone on second chance points to get their points if they're not shooting especially and you know that this Knicks team is going to lock up on D the rebound chances he just had 14 in this last game on like 19 rebound chances that was in the 28 and a half minutes I do think his contested rebounding chance will be pretty high uh, in this one considering how good uh, Sacramento has been at limiting offensive rebounds and getting and getting offensive rebounds on themselves and Hartenstein still held his the whole game uh, to get to that total for us. Golden State is allowing a ton of points to centers, uh, the, third, the eighth most to centers over the course of the season, uh, the fourth most rebounds to his rebounding profile as well for Hartenstein, who's a dude that will be running that pick and roll. He'll have some opportunities to run towards the rim on, on shots from his guys as well for some putbacks and things of that nature. So uh, the last thing too is he's going to be, like I said, as the role man, he's got the, the, the dubs are giving up the eighth most points per game to the role man in the pick and roll. That's the play that they run more than any other, aside from sort of JB isolation. Uh, and when Julius Randle is in there, they run a lot more ISO as well, but without Julius Randle in there, that, now you're talking about ISO for uh, Jalen Brunson, or preferably the way that they've been doing things is the, p the pick and roll. I just didn't I didn't know what to do with his 29 and a half points. And I don't know what to like with Jalen Brunson. Could he score 40 in this one? Yeah, he, he took he's taken 29 shots a game in his last two to get over 40 twice. Uh, so it's not like I would I, I, I would really consider it under for him. 29 and a half is high for anyone when the total is as low as it is. But we just saw him score 42 points in a game where the Knicks scored 98. Right. So this thing can still go well under with a few of the guys getting points here for, for the Knicks. And with OG still a little bit hampered, they're definitely going to be relying on a down low presence a little bit more. And Hardenstein is, is that guy once he gets the minutes back. Right. And I think he'll be in there for 30 in this one. Yeah, if he gets 30 minutes like, yeah, his rebound rate. I was looking at this like I, I think we expect rebounds to carry this more than points. Like just if you're trying to anticipate where where it's yeah. going to come from and you do get slight plus money for him to get 10 boards. So if you think the minutes are going to continue to climb, I think that's, that's probably the, the juicier bet is just taking the rebounds. But I, I, I could see him, you know, getting eight points easily on top of that. Uh, just, just from virtue of, of playing and pick and roll with Brunson and all the attention he's going to draw. That's it. Yeah, that's it for me. That's why it's the centers getting the, the points against the dubs made sense to me. It's like those are the rim runners and that's where they're weakest with really one dude. I mean, maybe you think Kaminga as well. He's only about six, seven. And then TJD, the rooks, like six, nine, maybe six, 10 on a good day and has that athleticism. But, both, you know, he's still only getting the like 17, 20 minutes. Right. And it's I would still take Hartenstein's uh, savvy veteran at this point sort of play over over TJD. So. 
That is all the time we have for you in Play of Props, though. Continue to follow along. Have our best bets video up for you as we do each and every weekday. Coming through, keeping it going as the postseason comes as well. So until we see you next, happy betting. Oh,